then we continue with description of, of the ports. Um, <coughs> port, the primary port service providers. Then we're talking about the, the, um, the ones that uh, takes care of the throughput. Is the, <coughs> the terminal operators that are, are in charge of, of operating the terminals. Uh, the stevedores who takes care of uh, the physical movements. Uh, ship ag agents dialogue with the uh, with the ship owners and uh, and uh, an interface between the ship owner and the and the cargo owner. Customs brokers takes care of c duties customs. Uh, pilot hitch and towage, which uh, is about the the ship operations, uh, <coughs> hand under edging, and the government custom service providers. And li a listing of <coughs> all the various uh, players in this is useful because you can then use that as a, as a categorization. And if you want to, to really study port efficiency, you could uh, you could gather data for each of them and try to to work out some kind of benchmarking port against port to see <coughs> whether they they perform uh, efficiently. We'll come back to that a bit later on. Ports and the national infrastructure. <coughs> It's uh, ports are defined as a vital part of a national uh, nation's, nation's infrastructure. Um, in Norway, this has been a big issue because we have had ports as organized under a different ministry than the, the um, let's say, the traffic along the coast. And it has been organized under a different ministry than the ministry that takes care of the roads and the ra uh, railways and the air transport. So the ports has been organized under the Ministry of uh, Fisheries. The railways, roads and air <coughs> ports has been organized under the Ministry of Transport and Communications. And the ship traffic has been organized under the Ministry of Trade and Commerce. And this has been a mess, to, to, to put it a bit bluntly. But it's difficult to put it in a more academic way. It's difficult to cooperate and to coordinate things when you have such a, <coughs> a distribution of responsibility. And in addition to that, which makes it even worse, is that the ports have been owned by the by the by the local communities, the communes, whereas roads, railways, airports are. Um, basically state-owned. The supports has been, <coughs> and they are still in the hands of the communes, even the bigger ports. So Oslo is owning Oslo port. So uh, there is then a need for alignment between the Oslo port authority, which is owned by the, by the city of Oslo, and the state, <coughs> which takes care of the railways and the connecting railways and roads. And this has led to some issues with respect to, to efficiency. Uh, <coughs> but they are regarded as a strategic part of the economy because it's a, they are linking the interface for, for international trade. Uh, as I said, they are also seen as uh, in the bigger ports, not necessarily the small port in, uh, in uh, here in Molde, for instance, but they are acting as hubs for regional development. And they may also, <coughs> in some cases, and uh, I can just refer to, to Russia and uh, Ukraine and, uh, and the peninsula of, of Krim to underline this point. Because the Russia's uh, naval fleet for the Black Sea was located in 
at the Crim Peninsula, which was then actually located in another country, which is quite special. I mean, if if one superpower has their naval fleet located within another country's jurisdiction, you may get problems. And uh <coughs> it used the Crim used to be a Russian port, but it was transferred to Ukraine in 1989 under a late-night party where President Yeltsin just transferred it to Ukraine. You can have it. Let me have another drink. It's also approximately like that. The story goes. So, uh, But that is politics. We are not going to engage in that, but it has, th th it is important also for, for that reasons. Ports. Container terminals <coughs> play a central role in most most major ports and intermediate ports. Not very important for a local port like uh, like the the one we have here, but the, the the nearest container port is in Olsund, some 60 kilometers away from here. And they are uh, the containers we have talked about a bit about that, and uh, I think you were also. We've dealt with that in during the maritime shipping lecture. I don't want to talk much about containers. It's obvious that a unified load carrier is an uh, advantage for uh, for uh, transport efficiency and also for intermodal transportation, which we'll talk about in a separate lecture. Uh, <coughs> Port's role. Um, I've talked a bit about that. I'm not going to, to spend much time on this slide, but, but the, the extended service provision is kind of the new, the new phenomenon which has emerged during the last, say, 10 to 15 years, perhaps 20 years, to, to include m more services like inland transportation from the suppliers to the port, from the port to the customers, and uh, and third party logistics services um, so we can again for analytical purposes it is can be good to divide the services into various categories the port facilities the infrastructure which consists of different components superstructure which has to do with uh, what is actually located in the port in terms of uh, buildings and uh, surface areas and so on and then you have the service <coughs> category which has to do with communication navigation uh, everything that has to do with handling of, of uh, ship arrivals and departures and then the final one here, which is has to do with with the flow of goods through the port. So this is kind of the basic things that is connected to throughput. Not so much to to value added services, but to throughput. So <coughs> this has developed over time. Um, first generation of ports merely focused on, on, on throughput, not much more than that. Uh, second generation of ports was more focused on, not so much on additional logistics operations within the port but more on, on the port as a as an engine for for uh, attracting businesses to locate in the vicinity of the port but not not fully integrated with the port here <coughs> we got the Say more focus on intermodal transportation, the port as an interface also against inland transport, 
inland waterways, short sea shipping, which was made possible by the emerging growth in container transport. The container is a prerequisite for this to happen. Without the container, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to see that you could have a very comprehensive system for, for intermodal transportation. And then <coughs> we got fourth generation, which, uh, which is also, uh, they are big, they have uh, specialized, uh, a specialized terminal structure, um, governed by a common administration. And uh, we could have added there also uh, a strong focus on, on value-added services. And those value-added services are located uh, close to or within the, the terminals. So <coughs> liquid bulk transportation uh, into the, like uh, I now mentioned, orange juice for the European market. <coughs> has a separate uh, terminal with a s with a factory that splits and packs this uh, this product. Car terminal <coughs> is uh, Sebrege is the biggest port for uh, importing uh, cars. Toyota has a <coughs> has a has uh, gone in with a strategic alliance alliance between uh, Sebrege port and Toyota. So they are shipping their cars in there and there they have a comparative advantage in terms of a very big land area so they haven't it has not been a need for building houses parking houses for the cars they can just park directly on the land without any more than uh, on a proper surface, a tarmac to park on. So it's uh, it's been a very cheap uh, thing where they have substituted the parking facilities, the built parking facilities, with uh, with with land because uh, because of the the land use uh, policy in the, in that area. And third-party logistics uh, operations are done there. So this summarizes the stages of port development <coughs> with uh, different periods and different uh, different aspects. Types of cargo, strategy on port development, scope of activities, organizational ca characteristics production characteristics and decision factors. And it's worthwhile pay paying attention to, to this, uh, this table. It summarizes um, a chapter in this, uh, in this handout that you have, that has been posted on Frontier. So <coughs> you might say that these these uh, elements from the after the 1980s is still integrated into this period, but there has been a strong focus on coordination, administration, and to, to be able to exploit uh, scope effects from a common uh, common administration and also to have perhaps common big terminal operators engaged in this. <coughs> Production characteristics. Labor intensive. <coughs> These are capital intensive ports. These big cranes, these, uh, these uh, gantry cranes, are equipment for loading and unloading container ships. You have two of them here, a medium-sized one and a, and a smaller one. Uh, and these are very expensive uh, types of equipment. I think it's only one port in Norway that has it, uh, that's Oslo. I think they have one crane or two. 
<coughs> so it used to be labor intensive, but a stronger focus on capital equipment to, to increase efficiency and to re reduce the dependency of, uh, of expensive, expensive labor. Um, improvement in productivity because of this change. At least some of the bigger ports has experienced uh, a dramatic increase in productivity. The smaller ones, a bit more mixed because of the, the labor intensity. You need, on the other hand, <coughs> big financial resources, access to big to, to financial resources to um, establish an infrastructure like this. Actually, there was one local entrepreneur here in this city of Molde who had a project of establishing something like this in, at, let's say, a bit further up north, the place called Yemnes. Have any of you heard about that? I don't expect you from Brazil to have heard about it, but uh, he, he, uh, he told the newspaper about this and he asked the newspaper to ask us here in Molde, at Molde University College what, what was our opinion about this? And we, <laughs> we thought, should we just be honest or should we be diplomatic here? We chose the first uh, option and said that this will in no way work here. It's way too big. We cannot exploit the scale effects. The, the demand for a system like this would be somewhere in this area with very high unit costs. It will not work. Whereas his dreams were that to, to have this as a transshipment port between Norway and Asia based on the Northern Sea Route, which goes north of Norway, north of Russia, and to, to, to Japan and China. It's a much shorter route than the route via Suez or around Africa. So his dream was something in this area with a much lower costs. But what we uh, knew then and what, we, what is the, the fact is that uh, you cannot take large container ships through the Northern Sea Route and it's way too, the, the variance in lead times are very too big because of the ice and the conditions up there. So um, we said that this, will not go, this is not going to work. So I think uh, that was the end of it. Uh, Public-private partnerships <coughs> is, uh, is uh, quite common in, in ports like this to be able to, to raise the necessary amount of capital, simply. So the private terminal operators is, uh, has engaged themselves in, in, uh, on the funding side of this. This is just a very, <coughs> very small, uh, a small uh, or an illustration of, uh, of the development in port efficiency or port productivity around the North, uh, the, uh, around the North Sea. UK, Sweden, and Norway, and then Denmark, and also Finland. Smaller container ports. I will not <coughs> go into details on how we perform an efficiency study like this. You can do that if you continue to, to write a master's thesis at some point in time, because there we can, we can apply this method in a, in a thesis, but not not on, the on, on this level, but the shorthand version is that ports that are performing, performing at the best practice frontier, the, the most efficient ports gets a score of 1.0. Those are the best performers. And then you can take the difference 
along this axis and say that, well, <coughs> the port's performing at with a score of 0 0.7. They have a, an improvement potential as compared to the best practice performer of 30%. So the potential for improving the situation for the average Danish container ports in 2002 was around 30%. <coughs> the best performers in this class is the UK ports, and here you see the development over time. So the <coughs> they they may have done something uh, something good in Sweden, because here you have a strong increase in in productivity, whereas in Norway the picture is not. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't look too good, actually. The Danes are also struggling, and so are the the Finns. They are least the least efficient ones here. And then we can <coughs> we can break this down into a second step, second stage analysis, and we can try to find out and to explain what is the difference. To explain the difference between. Norway and the UK between the Danish ports and the, and the UK ports. What could be the differences, the, the explanation behind the differences in efficiency? Just to, just to show you that port efficiency is an issue in many countries, Norway included. You, you have still here a potential uh, in 2008 at least, for of around 15% to become up to best practice efficiency. What you don't know here from an analytical point of view is whether the best practice performers ha have taken out all the potential for being productive. It could be that best practice can could be even further improved. That we don't know. But that is an issue, of course. But to monitor such development paths over time can, uh, can, uh, can inform a decision-making process and try to address what are the sources of inefficiency. And then we can base it on, let's say, various, we can collect data for various uh, elements here, how much, how many workers are needed, how many man years are spent on the various operations, could there be issues connected to outsourcing which could improve things here, and so on. It's quite tedious work, but uh, it has gained quite a lot of attention this type of studies in uh, in uh, in recent years. This is from a, <coughs> a PhD that was defended here last year, and I I I, I <coughs> was happy to supervise that one. Um, four players have a prominent role within within the port. It's the port owners, it's the shipping lines, the terminal operators, and the cargo owners. In some cases. These two are the same, one and the same uh, organization. But in the for the bigger ports, it's normally not. They are two different. And the, and the normal situation is that the terminal operators are private. So we can categorize them, <coughs> the ports, into type of ownership or administration because there are different uh, different models. Uh, three types according to the role played by the port authority. Uh, smaller ports still practice this model where the port authority they carry out uh, all operations, all activities. On the other hand, <coughs> the port authority may delegate everything to private sector companies. And then you may have, an, have a mix. 
So the bigger ports have, in to, a, to a large extent, chosen this model, where the port authority is a regulator, and uh, and the private sector companies are taking are in charge of everything else, more or less. But the medium-sized ports have a kind of a mixed <coughs> mixed uh, structure. <coughs> But the tendency as they grow is that they found, find it more convenient to, to have the private companies taking over uh, more of the operations. A port must fulfill <coughs> the three functions listed here. They have a regulatory function, port authority as a regulatory function. Because you have to, uh, as the port grows, you have to regulate who is going to be uh, located where, what types of terminals should we have uh, in different places, uh, what uh, types of terminal operators should we have. You may, you may want to decide upon should the tr terminal operators operate on a on conditions where they also invest in equipment and uh, and buildings if you do that you may need to enter into a more long term contract with the terminal operators if <coughs> the port authority is, is taking care of all the investments then you can have the terminal operators uh, working on shorter term conditions and it's not, it's not an easy answer to what is best there. But in general, if, <coughs> if the asset specificity is of such a... Uh, uh, and when I talk about asset specificity, I talk about the equipment that is needed to take care of the terminal operations. If the assets that are needed is strongly related to the type of operations that are going to be, be made. And if a terminal operator has the best skills, you might say, to choose and to develop the proper, uh, the, the most efficient equipment, you may want to let the terminal operators take care of that, do the investments, and have a longer term contract. If the asset specificity is low, and uh, the extreme is that the terminal operator is just coming in with some uh, some uh, forklifts and uh, equipment that can be easily used elsewhere, which is not dependent on that specific port operations. You can you can enter into shorter term contracts and perhaps have more competition about, uh, between terminal operators. So it depends on the nature of the operations. <coughs> and of course, you can have this operator function, which is quite common in, in when we deal, about sm uh, deal with smaller ports. Uh, <coughs> the regulatory function uh <coughs> is to try to transfer power to to uh, from the government which in and the government may then be the local commune as uh, in in Norway or it may be re regional authorities or the national authorities <coughs> that transfer power to the to the management of the port the, the overall management you have at least, uh, and, spe and speci uh, specifically in the UK, a um, larger amount of private ports, privately owned ports. I mean, there was a large privatization uh, going on in the UK during the 1980s, infrastructure of various kinds. Whereas in other countries, the ports are owned by the public authorities. But the transfer, of the regulatory power is, is transferred to the port port management. And it's done on a legal basis. 
stature in nature means that it is regulated by law. Ports, they control significant areas of land. I mentioned the uh, Seebrugge port, which is, which is uh, extremely land intensive. Big ports are, uh, demands quite a lot of, of land. And uh, <coughs> the landowner function, so maybe you heard about landlord ports, meaning that the ports are owning land, they are regulating the activities but others take care of the operations. That is sort of definition of a landlord port. But they own a lot of land <coughs> and they then can then engage in, in various types of, uh, of uh, functions. Amongst many, to take care of the port development issues. Marketing and promotion <coughs> could be important. Uh, and in this part of the activities, you have the uh, uh, analysis of competition between ports. Should ports engage, uh, if you consider two neighboring ports, should they engage in a fierce competition directed towards the same let's say, uh, ship operators? Or should they try to divide the market between themselves? So that one port takes care of, uh, let's say, uh, to put it very simple, the container side of the transportation business and the other one on bulk transportation. So if they <coughs> choose to, to focus on different activities, they create the kind of a, what we call a strategic distance between themselves and their competitor, which may be a good thing, at least for the ports. It may not necessarily be a good thing for the cargo owners, because the prices tends to go up that way. But that is a <coughs> an important job for the, for the management to, to sort of do that kind of strategic considerations, which is important for uh, also for the efficiency of the ports and uh, their competitive power. And again, you have all the practical things that are listed, listed on this slide. Yeah, so this is uh, what they do. We have talked about that, I'll just skip it. And this is a summary, uh, a very sh brief summary, which is also can, be, uh, can also be found in the paper. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, the ownership structure here, with a different mix. It most common is that the, regula uh, the re le regulatory power is on the public hands, apart from some countries like the UK, which has gone quite far in privatizing everything. It's not a clear answer to what is the best model here. It depends on the nature of the port. Uh, <coughs> this model with private regulatory authorities as well can constitute a challenge uh, with respect to uh, cooperation with road rail authorities which takes care of the hinterland transportation issues. So I have uh, been asked by, by the Norwegian Ministry of Transport and Communication about my view on port ownership, and I said that, well, <coughs> there is a trade-off, because um, a local ownership will, at best, create a kind of engagement from the local authorities, and it may be a good thing. Um, but on the other hand, it may also cause disruptions, lack of coordination, and uh, exploitation of mon monopoly power, which in total means a less efficient system. So I said I tend to recommend uh, 
a state ownership of the ports to have the same infrastructure ownership all over to be able to coordinate better. In some cases, that type of coordination is not a big point. In other cases, it might be a very important point, especially for the bigger ports with a lot of, uh, lot of movements. Then you need to have alignment between hinterland infrastructure and, uh, and the port infrastructure in a, in a very, very efficient way. <coughs> uh, but still, some, some ports may be, uh, may be local. And then you have also, I, I, I know this is public ports. I mean, ports that are open to general use. In addition to that, you have a lot of ports that are owned by specific companies. So what I'm talking about here is the ports for, let's say, open to everyone who wants to use it for uh, for shipping something. The 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 ports owned by companies is is a slightly different story. Then everything is private, and they the only <coughs> public engagement there has to do with uh, with pilot hitch and uh, other re regulations connected to to the to the operation of the ships, more or less. Yes, this is um, this is more or less what I already said. So I just continue, um, and this is <coughs> uh, just an elaboration of the responsibility for various operations connected to the different models that are uh, are applied over time this first model uh, with uh, with focus on uh, on throughput and public ownership Uh, and then the model where, it <coughs> where, it, where uh, activities are transferred to operators, which uh, which takes care of, of port operations. This is uh, an illustration which you can find in the paper from a port in big port in uh, in Pakistan, where <coughs> there is evidence that both models, but the public and the private sector dominated model can work within one and the same port. Uh, so you have a, sp uh, a split in, in, in ownership. And there may be good reasons for that. If you consider, uh, if you think about it, the extremes could perhaps be one port dealing with naval services, defense, strategic uh, issues, and the other which should be publicly owned, and the other, which deals with container transportation, which could could be benefit from a private ownership. So it, it's not. It's a very let's say diversified picture. This this uh, this uh, ownership issue. A short uh, comment on uh, terminal operators where the big ports, as I said, have now, uh, to an increasing extent, uh, made use of uh, transnational, multinational terminal operating companies, TTOs, which are specialized. And specialization is a key word here to exploit scale effects, scope effects. This is a list of the, the, big, the big 10 uh, from 2001 to 2009. Some of them have been around for a while, like HPH, SSA Maritime, <coughs> PO, I think. No, they are out of it, but Costco have been around for a while. So on. So, for those of you who are interested, you could uh, easily find, find their web pages and, and look into their operations. Please note also, I will, I will stop now. Uh, you can read the rest for yourselves, but please uh, note the main port types, local ports like this one here in this city, the feeder ports, which, is, uh, which are uh, medium-sized like Gothenburg, 
Gothenburg is actually the biggest port in Norway, even if it's located in Sweden, because they take the cargo in and take it by road or rail to Oslo, split it there uh, at, uh, at the Oslo main terminal and then on to the final destinations. And then you have the hub ports. And, uh, and the rest of the lecture notes describes the characteristics of each of these, these levels. And I might ask you at the exam, please describe the main port types and, character and their characteristics. I'm not saying that I'm going to do that, but uh, it's a possibility. Um, <coughs> I will post lecture notes uh, right after the lecture. There are some more slides which is not a part of the lecture notes but they are there for your, your convenience to perhaps elaborate a bit on, uh, on some of the matters. And there is also a couple of, a couple of videos that you can um, uh, link to a couple of videos, which you can watch if you like, about port operations and, uh, and ports. So then we are done for today, and uh, see you next week. Har jeg svart på det? Nei. Har jeg ikke gjort det? Hmm. Det pleier jeg å gjøre. Hva, 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 hva slags tema var det? Det var om møbelindustrien. Åja, oh ok. Den har jeg faktisk ikke sett. Um, men det, det du tenker på da, det er, altså hva er problemstillingen din? Jeg har en, det er en rapport som jeg eh, laget, eller ledet av hvem å lage i 2012, som har et case om møbelindustrien. Så, du så den? Ja, ja. kan ha vært den. Kan ha vært den, ja, sånn, den heter en sånn som uh, C.R. Chains, uh, den er på engelsk da, om sånn uh, ulike måter å organisere intermonal transport på. Og da var vi nede og intervjua en møbelbedrift her i fylket om hvordan de drev sin transport og hvordan de samarbeidet med nabobedriften og sånt som også drev med møbel. Og da, og det var Ikornes. Og de, de kjører jo et system med, hvor de har eh, sjøtransport til Rotterdam fordi at de eksporterer mye til USA. Men snabbe med driften, de, de har ikke noe marked i USA, de kjører kun til Europa, og da er det mye bil det går på. Og, så de har forskjellige typer transporter, avhengig av, avhengig av <coughs> hvor de har markedene sine. Jeg har, det er ikke veldig detaljert det som står i denne rapporten. Altså. Nei, det var uh, ikke så dypt inn på den. Så var Nei. det vanskelig om at jeg brukte det. Mm. Hvis jeg sender deg den uh, mailen en gang til... Så kan, 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 ikke du, kan ikke du gjøre det nå? Ja. Så skal jeg svare på den senest i morgen. Ja, for noen, noen, nei, men det, jeg skjønner at du vil ha svar, altså. Så pleier jeg å ordne det. Nå ble, nå ble vi filmet. Nå skal jeg ha. Jeg har ikke nødvendig å glemme det. Jeg leser.